term between science and fiction is, is a marvelous boundary. And ultimately, most science fiction becomes real. The work we did on the black hole, which I'll go into some of the details on that at the end here, is just that. When we set out to understand what this mystery was, they said, if you figure that out, you understand the nature of reality itself. And I think we did. And I say we, I'm going to kind of honor tonight's lecture to our esteemed Dr. Collier, who passed away a couple of months ago, and um, talk about an impassioned researcher. My idyllic world, something was wrong when I was one to two years old, started squinting out of this eye. And being the firstborn, your, your parents take a picture of you every hour, it seems. So they couldn't help but notice what's wrong with little Jimmy's eye. And I had some, on my father's side of the family, some very interesting relatives, some of them criminals, and some of them famous doctors. So I was in New York City before I know it, and um, getting seen by my uncle. He was a very famous doctor. I collected some of his memorabilia, Jimmy Durante. And this is, uh, and we have these on the table out there. Anybody want to see original autograph pictures? Ray Bolger, the Scarecrow of the Wizard of Oz. There's a famous dancer, Paul Draper. But there's a whole bunch of them that I didn't recognize. And um, that, that kind of heritage, it was fascinating to me as a little kid even. So by the time I was five, I'd been to so many doctors, and they never did figure out what was wrong with my eye at that time. Um, they, they made me think, I think I want to be a doctor. So when I was five years old, I said I want to be a doctor. I never looked back. I just didn't know what kind of doctor I wanted to be until I was in my uh, high school years. So I have this, um, this upbringing, and my parents said we had enough in New Jersey, and we moved out to Pennsylvania when I was about 10. But while I was growing up there, I started um, to develop a complex. I, um, I was in my books all the time because kids made fun of me. They walked around like this because when you have one eye that doesn't work, you need one that kind of fills it all in so you keep your head like this. You squint a lot because my eye hurt, the sun hurt it. So everybody made fun of me. And I got into my books. So here be me at my desk, you know, I just didn't want anybody to look at me, so there I was, keeping my head in there. And that's what drove me to, to love reading and to get impassioned about the written word. When I got to uh, Pennsylvania, puberty starts to kick in. And I decided I didn't have to be bullied anymore by my fellow classmates. So anyway, my father was doing some vision therapy called Bates Method. And he was doing crazy things from eye exercises to crawling on his hands and knees, patterning himself again. This is 1968, 1970. So but I, his, his eyes were getting better. So I said, well, maybe I could make this eye do something here. Now, ultimately, we did figure this out, that it was injured by the MMR shot, measles, mumps, rubella. That shot didn't go well for me. I still got measles. I still got mumps. Yet I got part of this contaminated batch that they apologized for decades later, but um, it caused a rapid infection, and my eye was attacked by this virus. So that's one of the reasons perhaps I was so attracted to Dr. Collier, the eye genius, to bring him into my practice 15 years ago, because if anybody could figure out how to undo that damage, he might be the one. But instead, we just figured out the nature of reality instead, so I'll take that exchange. But in Pennsylvania, I had a lot of culture around me. It was a, it was a great state. We had Pensbury Manor from William Penn, one of our constitution writers. I had the ability five minutes from my house to 
ride my bike and sit on the rocks that Washington, George Washington, used to launch his attack across the river, crossing the Delaware. I could go to Philadelphia, 30-minute drive, and go see the Liberty Bell. Touch it, actually. Today, no more. You get to um, look behind layers of bulletproof glass. I don't know, was anybody expected to shoot a bullet at the, at the Liberty Bell? I don't know why we're, we're so crazy about protecting that thing that way. But somewhere in there, I started developing writing urge. So I wrote my first book when I was in sixth or seventh grade as well. And um, still got a copy of that, A Submarine Adventure. But overall, school was almost boring for me because I was in my book so much that I didn't want to be that kid anymore, so my eye exercises started working. Pretty soon I could look normal, and I gave up that vision over there. And my brain somehow knows what to do. I can sense my hand moving, but I can't see it. So, and today I can ride motocross, fight martial arts, do all kinds of sports, and no one knows how my brain does what it does. So that's another one of the amazing things about our human nature here is its adaptability. So I changed my look in high school, got my leather jacket, rode my motorcycle. The Fonzie was a, he was my, my hero, Evil Knievel. And um, didn't want to look like all the nerds. So I'm in a class of 1,200 or so up in Pennsylvania, a famous high school, Pensbury High School. Today, if you look up Pensbury High School prom, you'll see that it's one of the most famous ones in the country right now because of the absurdity of it all. So that's the kind of place I grew up in as well. But I remember the day the guidance counselor brought me down the office and said, uh, you know, you're on your way to become the valedictorian, so you want to just keep going and you'll be fine. Well, I was getting a lot more confident in my looks, but I wasn't ready to give that speech yet. So I did a few little purposeful goof-ups and allowed my grade to drop down, so I class rank dropped down about 10 or so, sabotaging that moment. It didn't seem to matter to me. As I grew up, though, my parents said, you need to play some sports. I was so busy doing things. So um, I, was, um, I wrestled, then I swam. And we were on a state swimming team, state championship team. And I had such a crappy diet because you could do whatever you want. The government said, and the doctors with them, eat whatever you want. Um, let's see, the, trust the truck when it comes to your neighborhood spraying the pesticides. Let the dentist fill your mouth with mercury fillings. It's OK. The fluoride in your water is a good idea. And even more bad diet on top of that. So I was good at swimming, but I wasn't good enough to keep up with some of these champions we had there. So I went into gymnastics my last year. And um, that was a sobering moment for me because in the middle of, I think it was my 11th grade or 12th grade, one of the guys on our team, he was probably as good as anybody in the nation at the time, had a tumbling accident, and broke his neck, and died. And for the first time in my life, I felt mortal because we all grew up with this immortality, and kids still have that today, but I, um, I was, like most people, a little bit shocked as a youth that somebody could die who was that good. So I stopped doing gymnastics. And um, it's okay because chiropractic colleges don't have gymnastics teams anyway. But I didn't take it up again until 15, maybe 18 years ago. That was after I reached my pinnacle in martial arts and got tired of breaking my teeth and my ribs, and I feel, realized gymnastics was much more safe of a sport for me to do. But I off to go to um, Iowa for college. And when you're in the Middle West, the Midwest as we call it, there's a whole different breed of people there. It, it, it wasn't the 
East Coast attitude anymore. There was a whole lot more sense of family and love. So I got to thinking, I'm going to practice somewhere away from the East Coast. I'm getting away from all these crazy people out there. And when I visited different states, from California to Texas, I noticed something about Texas. Everybody waved to you down here. And no matter what it was, they waved. Now, we're seeing a lot less of that, obviously, because of all the people down here now. But in the countryside of Texas, you'll still see that. And that was so different than the middle finger wave that I got on the East Coast everywhere. So here I am in Texas. So my practice goes well. 1982, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, I was just growing exponentially and um, finding I had no limits. So that urge to write again started. In 1987, I started the book, which at the time was called Phantoms. And I never got past the first chapter. Something distracted me. One of the distractions was 1988. I um, made the mistake of going to Mexico. And I picked up a very, very bad infection, not sure, from swallowing the ocean water, the food, the bugs that bit me. But within eight days of returning, I had a fever that was unmeasurable, paralysis, and that was one of the few times I was very concerned about dying. But I had a lot of good friends, and we did a lot of alternative medicine. And I made a recovery. It took years. Turns out I had Lyme's disease. It was one of many things that were in me. And Lyme's does attack your nervous system. It can paralyze you or give you a lot of arthritis. Much to my horror this morning when I woke up, I can't make this stuff up, I found a tick embedded in my body. I think I got it out before the 24-hour window, but it wasn't easy. And um, I haven't seen one of those, but there must be some symbolism here today. I'm trying to figure that one out. So I recovered from that. And um, along comes a patient of mine, 1990. And she brings me an article that says, Ted Turner of Turner Broadcasting has a contest. $500,000, and it's, in, it's a reward for a book that someone is going to have to write that will change the world. They wanted some positive story so that past the year 2000, we would see some of the solutions for mankind's accelerating problems. Half million dollar first prize, rights to the book, movie rights, so I said, I think I'll do that. I got a book started. So I went to work, and it actually came out of me pretty easy. It was almost scary how easy that book, that book flowed. Ultimately, there was approximately 20, 25,000 people who tried uh, to write that book. They sent for the application kits, and one in 10 of us actually finished the book, about 2,000 entrants. I didn't win, obviously. Um, but a guy from Austin, Texas did. He wrote a book called Ishmael. I don't think anybody here may have read that, but apparently it had some deep thought in it that everybody was um, enamored with on the judging committee. But it wasn't good enough to make a movie because it was about a conversation between a man and a great ape. So it's just deep philosophical stuff. So I put my book on... Um, I tried to sell it, basically, and said, all right, we'll see. Because I had some people along the way help me work this thing up, and we read. I had a lot of readers, and they all said, hey, you got a pretty good book here, Doc. So um, I ended up getting some good feedback from some of the um, agents out there. So I was encouraged to write uh, a little bit more of an ending by one of them, to take it from a trilogy-type book to a bigger final book. And something happened along the way. I went to a lecture by a guy named David Adair. If you go look him up, he's quite a character as well. He's a rocket scientist genius. His company bridges technology from NASA to the real world. And um, this group I was with called the Eclectic Viewpoint, we were sponsoring various lectures. We brought him in to talk about his work with NASA. And he had some fascinating stories, but he started describing a rocket engine in his lecture that he had developed. 
and subsequently destroyed because his engine could go to light speed and sound sci-fi, but it did. And um, when he found out the military wanted this to change the balance of power in the world, because with mutual assured destruction, both countries launch at the same time, everybody dies. But if you could send your missile at light speed over to China, let's say, we would win. So he didn't like that idea and um, destroyed his rocket, which got him on the bad side with various powerful government groups. But as he was talking, and I had a number of technologies I describe in my book, one of those is a, is a rocket engine and fuel that I had dreamed up for civilization. I think, hey, that kind of sounds like my engine. So I drew out for the first time a design of this engine and um, had dinner with the guy. And afterwards, I plopped down, it was several of us in this group, plopped down my drawing and I said, hey Dave, what do you think about this rocket engine? Now he had a little bit of a lisp, and this is exactly what he sounds like. So he says, well, you got the magnetoheterodynamic pinch bottle effect a little bit too far forward of the hydrogen catalyst fuel injecting system, and, and, he, and he looks up and he says, wait a minute, that's my engine, where'd you get that? And I said, that's what I thought. So I told him a little bit of the story, it just came to me as I was writing my book. And he said, well, you better be careful you put that book out there because uh, there are some people who don't want this engine out there. So that got me a little bit concerned. So I decided I, maybe I shouldn't go push this book right off the bat. I don't know what else I had in that book. And then if that wasn't bizarre enough, my, um, my aunt on my mother's side contacts me, who I hadn't seen for years, and says, um, somebody who's a friend of mine, she's a diplomat to the United Nations, and she knows you wrote this book, and she knows how you got the information in the book. And um, would like me to encourage you to get this book published, because mankind needs it. So I went back up to Pennsylvania, and I got the proof of who this woman was, and that's for another lecture, because it actually involves extra dimensions, perhaps extraterrestrials at this point. Um, but somehow, they told me things that nobody knew and, and what was in this book. And apparently somebody else was given similar information who wrote another book that I ultimately tracked that book down and found out that was kind of prophetic as well. But ultimately what kept me from publishing my book was children. I wanted to be a good parent, so I put the book aside and stayed with my office, my practice, my patients, my other little passions, but writing was just not something that seemed to be important. Before you know it, all these years go by and the year 2012 is approaching. And so I think I better get this book out because it had a clock ticking in it. And the story begins after we get past the year 2012 and we all thought we were in the clear, the mind calendar silly stuff. And everybody then starts to be no more prophecies, no more danger. So we go on, and in the book, we start producing rapid growth into space, and we're starting to see all this right now. We're going to have, there's a guy who's got a half a billion dollars invested in building a space hotel, and it's going to happen. I keep my nose and ear and everything to the ground, whatever you want to call it, and I can say is you fellow humans have no idea what's coming if you don't stay up on technology. But in a few decades, artificial intelligence will be so advanced that your consciousness can be downloaded into a machine. Teletransportation is almost fully functional. 3D printers have almost made the replicators realistic. Um, most diseases are right on the verge of being recoded out of our genes. And all this is just within a few decades if we manage to not kill ourselves off. And I believe we won't kill ourselves off. I think this technology is here for a reason. But you will not recognize what our planet and our human race is going to be like in this short period of time if you all stay healthy with me. Um, that's why I'm staying young. I can't wait to see the show when it starts. So. I started to write this book again. I pulled it out, added on to the ending. 
I had to update some of the science fiction because it had become true. But I noticed along the way a lot of the characters had shown up in my world. They were dreamed up by me years ago, but now they're real. They were people from my practice, friends. So I'm trying to understand what all that means because when you think, what is science fiction? What is any fiction? Your mind is creating another miniature reality that you are the god of. That's your world. You create that. And yet, where did you get that from? Do we make up anything? Or is it all part of some giant cloud of consciousness that we're just pulling information in and out with our brain like a transceiver, we call it? So we get the book. And um, I thought I knew everything about publishing, but that was all worthless because nobody was reading anymore. The book industries were in trouble. Um, publishing as we know it was changing. Electronics were taking it over. I don't know if anybody's going to read in the future. We may just all download like the Matrix all the books we want into our brain and just skip the reading part altogether. That's what people want. They want to not have the patience to get information the old-fashioned way. But I put the book together and I said, all right, I'll just self-publish it. Because now you can print on demand. I don't have to have a thousand books at once. Just print them up as I need them here. So the story in this book is humanity. It's 18 characters, eight major ones, interacting underneath a very stressful situation as a small fractal of the big problem in the future. And they have a lot of questions, and so my book takes you into the future and helps answer the questions that are our present day questions. At least helps in a way that through my mind. And ultimately, I decided at the end that when I had to define this book, science fiction, thriller, action adventure, but ultimately it's romance. And I will read something here at the end as to how I feel humanity has to go from a standpoint of the concept of love if we're ever going to get through this evolution that we're going through. When we get from this concept of this space hotel, this spin, the word majestic, of course, represents the name of the hotel, but it also represents something bigger, the one. I have the K on here just to catch people's eye, but it represents the Russians who built the space station. They seem to be very forward-thinking. I've got a lot of great Russian technology in my office that um, I don't know why the Americans people didn't come up with it, from vibration boxes to the Lakowski multiple wave oscillator that stimulates cellular regeneration. So I figured we'll give them, and actually they were the first ones in space, so I give them the space hotel. So that's the Majestic 1. The Majestic 2 never got built because things happen. But ultimately, the science I came up with in there was all about what's good for the future of humanity. And what is good for the future of humanity? What's good for us is energy, free energy. Because everything that's wrong with how we do business as humans is linked to the types of energy that we're allowed to use. So the demonstrations of what's coming, besides the little things flying around that we don't know who's flying them, that seem to defy gravity. Just go on the internet and look up lifters. Go on YouTube, type in lifters, lifter organizations. There's people out there who are levitating things all over the place. They build a little frame out of balsa wood. You put um, high voltage rectifiers into these things. You turn them on, you gotta have them anchored down to your table and they just shoot right up. There's no magnetic field. There's no fans or anything. They are just levitating. They're miniature little UFOs right there, and the instructions are out there needed to build your own. Or look up some of the free energy devices where people are spinning things in new ways. You can take a standard motor and how we have the wiring around it, and someone came up with the idea, what if, instead of going the way we usually do, 
I wind them in this hexagonal form, the Star of David, and just set up the coiling differently. Lo and behold, the motor puts out 30, 40% more torque and more energy, just structure. There's a, um, I think it was high school level, kid who looked at solar panels and said, all right, we only have so much efficiency. These things are very frustrating technology for the world right now. But what if, instead of lining them up in these nice panels, what if I just spread them out like a tree branch? Because ultimately a tree with its leaves using Fibonacci spiral sequencing, his little kid is thinking about the spiral already. I like them. But he just laid them out like a tree branch, same number of chips, little silicone chips. And then he laid them side by side and put a voltmeter on each one. And you want to guess what happened? The one laid out like a tree branch produced more voltage from the same amount of sun. And there's no way to explain that with regular physics. It's quantum physics. Things happen because of structure, sacred geometry, so to speak. The energy that drives the vortex, the spiral torque, is the source of what our humanity has to go to. We have to tap into that. Because right now we artificially spin things. We'll pump a bunch of water through something. We'll burn things and push it with combustion. Um, everything is about creating torque the hard way, damaging the resources of the earth in the process, creating wars and fighting over them. But it's a very inefficient system in a good way because it creates lots of jobs for everybody. So, we don't want to get rid of it very easily because if you put all this free energy to work, what you get is probably 50% unemployment in the world in no time. So we have to be patient. And either we're going to figure out something for everybody to do or something's going to thin the herd population down dramatically and match it to the new form of energy. So let's get into how this vortex works. Part of it is this poster over here, which I came up with years ago. On, um, this is a genealogy study of the world's healing arts, and I superimposed this genealogy into this symbol. I put this thing above some distant planet to make people think of it in a different way. But inside of here, you have these triangular pyramidal type shapes. And you can use this vortex concept in a lot of ways. This was just a cool way of teaching people how to do a cancer journey. So someone could say, I've done this, 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 and this, put pins in it. Because they always would say to me, what do I do next? I've got so many things to do, so many cures that it might work, and I have a clock ticking. So we could see that, hey, you've been in this region a lot, you haven't gone over here. So is this a guide to show people the three major forms of healing that came from the world? And out of triads come dichotomy, come yin and yang. So it all began when I was looking at a picture of poor Stephen Hawkins, our great physicist crippled up with ALS. And I was reading an article about him in the black hole. So I brought it to Dr. Collier, interrupted his thought patterns, and I said, what do you think about this poor guy here? He's never going to live long enough to ever discover how a black hole really works. And before I could even say in that sentence, he says, well, I know how it works. And I said, how? He says, well, it's nothing more than a binary optic lens system transferring dynamic energy through a spiral wave pattern through a vortex. And it creates negative refraction index, which causes it to be cloaked. And he, didn't, he drew out a mathematical formula. And if you've ever seen the mathematics that Dr. Collier has put up with over the years, it's genius level. I looked at that, and I go, OK. Um, you think he's never thought of this before? He says, probably not, because they're working on the fact that there's an object inside this hole, and there probably isn't. And so from there, I took that, and I thought about it, and thought about it, and I went to him about a week later, and I said, we need to write a paper. Somehow, I think we should help him. And the reason I thought of this is because someone else had come into my life, a very eminent professor from one of the local universities, who had connections all the way up to these people at that level. And I thought, in a giving way, let me just write up something, and we'll pass it on to Stephen so that he might 
finally realized where his mistakes were in his mathematics. And when I went to my professor friend and told him this, he said, just write the paper up on your own. He won't listen to you. <laughs> so we wrote our own paper. It took me three years. You have no idea how torturous that was, trying to get stuff out of a man's mind who is incapable of simplifying anything. And what we found is that the current model works like this. You take a star and you expand it and then blow it up, but it collapses back upon itself so fast that it begins this process of ever getting smaller and heavier. This is where your imagination has to go a little bit wild. Ultimately, does this make sense? The, the heavier, the smaller something gets, the heavier it gets. So if you say to these people who write out this complicated math, well, how small does it get? And they go, well, it can get really, really small to the point where it may just disappear someday. Well, where does it go? And a whole galaxy is packed into a spot that's smaller than a pinhead? So they have mathematics on that that unless you know how to read it, it's BS. The mathematics they have basically are describing what happens inside that mass, that hole, and what happens on the outside. And mathematics is all about balance. When you think about science and math explains the world, how does that work? Math has to base its, um, its truth on something that we know to be, as best we can de determine, pure and truthful and unchangeable. So we use that as a standard and then we compare it against it. And we call that the equation. And there's always an equal sign or something that says approximately equal. And that's how most mathematics works. It's comparing one system against another. And then within each side of those equations, you have another comparison, the top to the bottom. We call that the numerator bar, the division bar. And we put the numbers up there, we put concepts, but it looks more complicated at that point, but it's this process of deduction. It's forks in the road. It's all mathematics is. So the mathematics of a black hole basically say, what's happening on the inside, trying to make it equal what's happening on the outside, comes up with this point of infinity, and mathematicians hate infinity because it means it goes on endlessly, and that's not a viable answer. That's a religious, spiritual answer. So they changed the word infinity to singularity. So now you know what a singularity is. It's a point of nothingness, a point of potential. And the math was struggling. It kept making things up in fudge factors to make these holes that they thought they knew where they existed to work, but they didn't work. So we didn't have too much of a problem writing a new paper because once you understood their secret language, they, they had a big problem in there. There's a lot of problems in mathematics right now with science like that because the other thing is um, the sun. That's right around us. By the way, here's a fun little, it's a, not a joke, it's, one of those pondering questions. Can you see any stars during the daytime? And most people start getting real complicated about this idea. Well, what if I put special sunglasses on and everything? But the fact is, the answer is yes, it's your sun, it's a star. Of course you can see stars in the daytime. But what is this sun? You know, the theory says that it's this flame from combustion. You're putting elements, hydrogen and hydrogen, banging together, becoming helium. And that process burns like a fireball. The only problem is there's over 12, up to 15 different mathematical problems right now that say that doesn't work. You don't need any of that math to know they're wrong because you can look at the sun and see that there is sunspots on occasion, even without any special lenses. A sunspot is a dark spot. It's a cold spot. It's a hole in the sun peering down into it. It's cold, but the math and the model of the sun say that the deeper you go in the sun, the hotter it gets. So that alone right there is some of the BS of what's wrong with some of that. But the sun represents perhaps an electrical universe. It could be like a, a cathode glowing with electrical energy coming off of it. 
So we're going to discuss the concept of plasma. The, the physics of our world say there are solids, then it gets a little more spaced out, there's liquids, gets a lot more spaced out, there's gases, and then there's a fourth state of matter known as plasma, and that's where you get into that energy that's all around us. They call it dark matter, dark energy. They have no idea how to measure it most of the time. That's because they're trying to measure all that using Einstein's field equations, which are known to be based on gravity alone and mass. They're not using the electrical nature of the universe. So that's what Dr. Collier and I did. We got into the electrics of it. We got into the energy. And we said, okay, so what else could make this thing that looks like a black hole do what it does? And we found out it would be a real hole. It would be a spiral. And as we defined that over the years, we discovered that there is black holes everywhere. There is one in a tornado, in a hurricane. There's one even in your DNA because there's a spiral in it. Anywhere there's a spiral, there's some form of level of a black hole. So when it gets really, really big, it becomes science fiction-ish. But here's what a black hole does. It's a bridge between two dissimilar systems trying to find equal. So before we get into that, this is what the symbol of the Chinese, the yin and yang, is. It's an endless chase of each other. And that chase is what drives our existence. They can never catch each other, though, because if they do and become truly equal, then all energy stops flowing in life as we know it stops. So that's why life is unfair, because that would mean everything would be equal. So when we do a spiral, and we draw out a spiral, if I say I'm going to make one loop around, there's a ratio of how big each loop is. And that ratio changes. It's not twice as big, it's 1.618 times bigger. That's called the golden ratio, the pi ratio. There's another one who came up with a ratio like that, close to it, named Fibonacci. Leonardo Fibonacci. By the way, if you want your kids to be smart, just name them Leonardo. Got Leonardo da Vinci, Fibonacci, there's a lot of Leonardos, or maybe just get some Italian blood in them. But Fibonacci said, I got a spiral, but I'm going to start it from zero, a, a finite point, and I'll grow out. And his spiral ratios were big, and then they equilibrated out at just below 1.618, but they never quite reached it. So his spiral shows up in some architecture and some of nature, but the majority of the spirals are based on the, the golden ratio spiral of 1.618, which has no beginning and no end. That kind of fits a lot of our metaphysics and our religion. And so what is 1.618 as a ratio? If I were to define a line on the floor from that wall to me, and then go over so far and say, all right, I'm going to divide this line. So between here and here, this piece is 1.618 times bigger than this piece. Easy enough. Mathematics can reciprocate this, where I can say from there to there is 62% of the way, and that's 38% of the way. It's the same thing, it's just looking at it a different way. So when you understand those two things, you can see that that number, that golden ratio, there, by the way, there's a book called The Golden Ratio, Life, diet and Lifestyle, which I put out in my email to everybody who's patient of mine. And uh, you'll find a lot of this in here. So in there, you'll see things that if I were to like stand that little ratio up and light a candle, the bottom of the flame, but it's blue, is 38% of the distance, and then to the tip of the yellow is the other 62%, exactly. If I were to take a piece of DNA and measure the length of one turn of its spiral, and compare the length of that to the width. It's 1.618 times bigger. Exactly. Over and over and over again, the spiral works. So the spiral, though, is a dynamic torque system of energy that just flows. So we wanted to know, because we want to know how a black hole works, how does it flow? So we got into all these ideas is explaining the environment that changes as this thing um, in space or even around you exist. 
And we ultimately found the answer through a guy named Josephson. He is a um, Nobel Prize winning researcher. I don't know if he's still alive or not, but his ideas are still used in a lot of our computer circuits today. So what Josephson found is he was running electricity through a plate that was superconducting and another plate that was superconducting. First of all, what is superconductor? Superconductor is something that's carrying energy, electricity in this case, electrons, without any resistance. It goes from point A to point B flawlessly and infinitely fast. It may even exceed the speed of light. It's made um, possible by dropping the temperatures down to ridiculously low values. The coldness of space is what you need. And a lot of different materials can be superconductive at different temperatures. There's only one thing that can move energy and electricity around above these hundreds of degrees below zero. And that's the human brain. It's superconductive, and they have no idea how our brain does it. But I do, because you have a spiral going through you, and that allows that energy to flow at those speeds. So the absolute coldness of space is what gives space its support, its buoyancy, its structure to hold the energy that everything is made in. It has to be that cold. So he, you can make an artificial superconductor and he put an insulator between them so they wouldn't touch each other. It's like an Oreo cookie. And he found though that stuff was leaking through, little particles of subatomic energy, but they were nonetheless doing that and they would kind of spiral right through. They call that quantum tunneling. That's what he won his Nobel Prize for. And he didn't quite know what he had there though. How do you explain that? There's no way that those things should have been able to touch each other, but under those conditions of superconducting, they did. So that's what got us thinking. So let's take the vortex of the tornado, the black hole of the tornado, and we have a certain amount of energy in the ground and a certain amount in the atmosphere above it. Under certain conditions, those two systems have to find equalness Remember, they never can be equal, so there's always going to be a flow. They'll connect with lightning. But if that's not enough, a vortex will form. And it just moves information and energy from one side of the system to the other until it's finally equilibrated itself to a degree and established the ratio again. That's why tornadoes only last so long. So we should be able to measure those forms of energy, and we should be able to generate a counter energy and neutralize that. Imagine flying a plane over a potential tornado cloud and having a generator in there send out a certain frequency and turn off the tornado. That should be worth a Nobel Prize. I'm working on that next. So ultimately in space then you have systems. Which system? Our reality, our three-dimensional world has a leak and the next dimension out, the next reality, certain conditions form and an opening forms. You can make your own vortex in your tub. Fill it with water and pull the plug. The system above being drawn by gravity down to the system below will want to spin out of there as it leaves. It just can't do it any other way. It has to torque itself. So. We're looking in space and saying, well, where's this thing going? And we started measuring all kinds of things. How does it form that shape? And we found out how all the elements fit in there, why we have the periodic table, where's iron and copper. If you were to create a spiral, you can see that all the elements fit in a certain place. There's a place for them. And each one of them serves a role to create the shape of that. It's an amazing system. So we think that the vortex is going through and comes out as a sun on the other side. So think of a sun as the inside out version of a black hole. And using the right technology you should be able to go through that sun down to the other side. And yet we fear it. 
everything from don't look at the sun, you'll go blind. Actually, I used the sun. My eye was so sensitive that I would do crazy things like this, and I'd force my eye to look at the sun. It got desensitized to a large degree. It worked, and didn't make me see any worse, so it didn't hurt. So anyway, suns are possibly the inside-out version of a black hole. You'll never think about your sun again the same way. So we're trying to find practical applications of what we can do with this without ruining the economies of the world. That is the problem. That is the gift we have and the curse we have at the same time to learn how to pace all ourselves here. I have, um, where did I put that? Over here. So when I wanted to write up the book, I didn't want to make it all about the energy because that's not what humans need right now. We need to have the patience to get through this journey that is just right around the corner. So from the humanity side, what I want people to feel when they're done reading is to understand that we were lost but now found. We were of love and now remember. We are stronger than our fears and have no limit to what we will become. Most of all, we will be satisfied in our hunger for truth. But till then, we will be humble in each other's arms. That is the message I want out of Majestic One, is humanity. And with that, we shall finish tonight. I'll be out there if anybody wants to have any conversation with me. Thanks for coming.